This is the time in our service where normally we would affirm our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. But as important as it is to affirm our faith using our words, it's also important to use our actions to say what we believe about who God is. Today we are kicking off our 30-day long Love Your Neighbor Kindness Campaign. Now, I know all of us are trying to love our neighbors a lot more than just in one season, but in this time when we are so polarized and divided as a country, the idea is that by even just simple acts of kindness and compassion, we can restore some civility and try to be a beacon of hope and kindness in a really broken world. We're gonna be doing this in lots of different ways. One is through this insert that you have in your bulletin that gives you 30 different examples of random acts of kindness. Um, we would love for you to do as many of these as you can and to share on social media um, what you're doing with the hashtag, hashtag loveyourneighborwumc so that we can all celebrate that together. Also, um, we have really fun t-shirts like this. Uh, we're hoping that when you're at Harris Teeter or out walking the loop that you're going to see a whole bunch of people wearing these shirts and that that'll remind all of us to love our neighbors well. And finally, we have um, one piece that actually is a little bit delayed. Um, who here on your way to church this morning saw a campaign sign? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. I feel like all of a sudden they just popped up like dandelions everywhere. Well, we think it would be really cool if in the midst of all of those, there was a reminder to love your neighbor. So we are going to have starting next week, um, yard signs for you to take and either put in your own yard or put one of those places, one of those traffic medians that you see um, political signs and say, you know what, what we can all agree on is that we want to show love to our neighbors. Um, unfortunately, those signs were delayed actually because they're being produced in Florida. Um, and so um, those were affected by both Hurricane Helene and then also Hurricane Milton this past week. So um, as we wait on those signs, um, please do keep all of those folks in Florida in your prayers. Our prayer is that this will be a season when we can come together both as a church and then can help our community of Wrightsville Beach and Wilmington to come together on the common ground of loving our neighbors. And to start that off, I'm going to invite you now to stand up and greet those around you with the peace of Christ. Peace. Peace. Fabulous job. needing to rush you when you're all loving each other so well, but I would now like to invite Gwen Holly to come forward to share with us our psalm for October. I will be reading today from Psalm 119. Do good to your servant, and I will live. I will obey your word. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. I am a stranger on earth. Do not hide your commands from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times. You rebuke the arrogant who are cursed and who stray from your commands. Remove from me scorn and contempt for I keep your statutes. The rulers sit together and slander me. Your servant will mediate on your decrees. Your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There is Lord Jesus, ruler of all
Let us go before God in prayer. Holy and loving God, thank you for giving us a new day and new life. We come to you today, each carrying the stories of our lives, the joys, the worries, the hopes, and the burdens. You see them all, Lord, and you welcome us just as we are. We thank you for the gift of your love that meets us in every season. And today, we ask for your grace to help us share that love more fully with those around us. Lord, as we begin our kindness campaign, we pray that our small act of love will glorify your name and spread your light in the world. May each moment of our lives reflect your heart. Let our words be gentle, our hands be willing to serve, and our hearts be open to embracing those we meet along the way. Lord, we lift up those who are hurting and struggling right now because of the recent hurricanes. For those who have lost homes and communities, wrap them in your comfort and surround them with people who will stand with them through this difficult time. And teach us how to best serve and support so that our health can truly bring hope and healing. And now we lift before you those whom we name with our voices or hold in our heart. Grant, bless him, and bless Judy. Lord, hear our prayers. Pour out your grace and love upon them, and guide us filled with your love and ready to share it. May we be neighbors who care deeply, act justly, and walk humbly with you. We offer this prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we transition to the time of our offering, <coughs> let us respond to God's grace and God's generosity. As our <laughs> ushers to come forward, you can contribute by placing your offerings on the plate or um, using QR code in the insert. Let us continue to worship God. <laughs>
You may be seated. It is time for a children's message. If there are any kids, please cooperate and welcome. And welcome to cooperate and join me this time. for being here today and actually um, uh, well Mia has been a really really great student for this time so it is okay for today <laughs> okay thank you okay hi hi what, what is your name see Anderson Anderson hi Anderson good to see you today how are you good good <laughs> okay um please be kids um I very welcome you join me this time okay okay are you ready so today I have a little game for you, a little quiz, a little game for you. So I'm going to describe some acts of kindness and I want you to guess what they are. It is really simple, really easy. Okay, so ready. So first one, what is something you can say to someone in the morning that says hello? Yes, good morning, right? I said, I told you it is really easy, right? Yes, and second one, what can you say to someone who helps you to show that you really appreciate them? Thank yeah, thank you, right. Okay, good job, by the way. Oh, wow. Okay, last one, what can you say to someone to let them know they did a really great job? Good job, good job right, yes, good job, great job, yes. Wow, right, Phil, big kids, you're so smart that you really know what kind this looks like. And the cool thing is, these are all things that you can do to show your love to others. So today we are talking about what it means to love your neighbors. And well, sometimes we think that loving your neighbors should be in a very, very big way, right? And also like to the very like strangers. But actually, first of all, neighbors, are not just the people who live next door. They can be anyone around you, your family, your friends, and your colleagues, and even the person you can see at the grocery store. And the second one, love can be shown in small ways too. Just as we said, good morning, thank you, like great job. Thank you for doing this, right? Yes. <laughs> So today, uh, I want to uh, give you some uh, information. Probably you can find this bingo, kindness bingo, as one of your inserts in the bulletin. And actually, this is kindness bingo. And um, this is the very full of simple act of kindness you can do every day for the next 30 days intentionally. And um, the best part is, Probably some of things are things you need you will need a little help with It means you get to invite your family your friends or your colleagues around you to join you and Then when you are doing this you are spreading kindness together So for example, you could um, ask your friends to surprise a neighbor with freshly baked cookies or treats so you can bake cookies together and then share that together. Or you can work together with your colleagues or friends or your family to send a thank you card to the local fire department. So every time you complete a one of the simple acts here, you can mark it up and then you complete a whole row and you make a bingo. <laughs> and after this worship service, if you are very willing to do more and more, you also get this colorful paper to this. So you can put this in your refrigerator or in your or netbook or a notebook or in, on your desk. And then intentionally next for three days, just let us share more kindness and love through our this community. Okay? Yes, let us pray together. Dear God, thank you for loving us and thank you for teaching us about love. Help us be caring and sharing our love with others. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good 
Good morning, everyone. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good to be here on an absolutely beautiful Sunday morning. I was looking at the uh, 30 acts of kindness that Pastor and Sue was just talking about. If you want to pull that out of your insert so you can look at it. I noticed that the very first one at the top left says, Donate to Hurricane Helene victims in Western North Carolina. I just want to give you an update that um, so far our church has raised $26,000 to help folks um, in the western part of our state. And you can continue to do that um, by writing a check uh, to UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief. Um, or you can uh, go to our website, rightswillumc.org, go to the Give Now um, tab on the front page of the website, and it'll give you the option to uh, give money to UMCOR as well. So, um, and then you could just mark that right off your list, right there on the 30 Days of Kindness. Um, let's look at our scripture for today. It's also in an insert. It's a blue piece of paper from Luke chapter 19. Luke tells us, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he's going to be the guest of one who's a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we ask that you be with us today, that you would inspire us with your Holy Spirit, and Lord, um, that we might become more like Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, I'll be honest, I don't really know what it's like to live life on the fringe of society. I'm a white man born into a comfortable family in a nice neighborhood in the suburban south. When I grew up, I went to college and grad school, and I've always had a job and a stable home life. Now, I wouldn't say that I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, but I have had some advantages compared to a lot of other people in this country, and especially compared to lots of other people around the world. Nevertheless, I've also had plenty of problems. We've all had problems, right? And I certainly know what it means to feel rejected. We learn that at an early age, don't we? The friend we wanted to play with goes to play with someone else on the playground. Later we find out there's a birthday party being planned by one of our classmates and we didn't get an invitation. We're rejected when we want to have a romantic relationship. We're rejected by colleges and when we're trying to look for jobs or trying to get a promotion. And those parties, well, they just keep happening, and while we're invited to some, we're not invited to all. In my line of work, sometimes people reject the message I'm trying to share. And you know what? Sometimes it isn't the message, it's the messenger. That's just how it goes. That's life. I don't like it, but I realize that rejection is part of it. Right after the brilliant founder of Apple, Steve Jobs, died, someone made this observation. They said, 20 years ago, our world had Steve Jobs, Johnny Cash, and Bob Hope. Now we have no jobs, no cash, and no hope. <laughs> now, it's true that there are people who are unemployed, and there are even more people who are in debt, but if Jesus Christ is who he said he was and did what he said he did, then we should never be without hope. That's especially true of people on the fringe, people we would consider as struggling. In this series, we've been asking people to be like Jesus. And we've seen over and over again that Jesus is, continues to look toward the people that we might turn our backs on. The very people we don't give the time of day to, Jesus gave most of his time to. Today we're going to study about an encounter that Jesus had with a total reject. Now I first learned about him when I was in preschool. 
And in fact, I learned about them in a song you may have as well. Let's see how many of you remember that song and how it goes. I'm going to recite part of it and then I'll have you fill in the blanks, all right? This is how it goes. Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a... Oh, good, he climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, for I'm going to your house today. For I'm going to your house today. That's right. That song comes right out of this story in the Gospel of Luke. The first two verses of the chapter clue us in to just how interesting this story is going to be. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. The story takes place in Jericho, a city about 17 miles northeast of Jerusalem. It's a border city near modern-day Jordan, set at an international crossroads a place where northern, southern, eastern, and western highways all come together. It was a rich city back then due to its great palm forests and fig trees. Now, taxes were actually collected at three different points in Israel, in Capernaum, in Jerusalem, and Jericho. But by far, the most lucrative was Jericho. Now, Luke tells us that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. Now, that's the only time that term is used in the whole New Testament. To refresh your memory, the Romans occupied Israel at this point in history, and the Roman government would collect taxes from the people to pay for government services and infrastructure, just like the IRS does today. But where the systems differ is that the Romans would bid out the position of tax collector to whoever would pay them the most money. They would then give that person a quota of taxes to collect, but they were not limited to that quota. Now, they weren't paid a salary. They made money by adding a surcharge or a user fee, like Ticketmaster does, okay, or like an ATM machine does. The surcharge could be as high as they wanted it to be, and you had to pay it. But Zacchaeus wasn't just a tax collector. He was the chief tax collector. In other words, he had other tax collectors working under him. In effect, he was the CEO of a tax-collecting corporation, and he had people under him who did all the dirty work and then paid him the greatest part of the profits. So he's part IRS agent, and he's part mafia boss, if you will. And it's all perfectly okay with the Roman government. You want to talk about a reject? He's a Jew who's a tax collector for the Romans. That made him a thief and a traitor in the eyes of his fellow Israelites. His family would have probably disowned him. His friends would have long ago deserted him. And everybody he encountered feared and despised him. But that's his own fault. His rejection came honestly. The chief tax collector in Jericho was considered no better than a murderer to the people of Israel. Now he did have power and he did have money. But he was hated by everybody. In fact, he didn't even deserve the name that he had. The name Zacchaeus actually means clean or innocent. Well, he was neither one. He was dirty and guilty. Now, the story tells us in verse 3 that Zacchaeus was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. Okay, at this point, Jesus has been ministering for about three years. And his fame and name have been spread throughout the countryside. The man who could raise the dead, walk on water, calm a storm, and feed thousands with just a couple of Lunchables was very well known. Okay? So he's coming to Jericho. There's no farming today, no schooling today, no working today. The whole city had turned out to see Jesus. The streets are packed. All the front seats were gone. It's a sellout crowd. Standing room only. The only seats left are in the nosebleed section up in the trees. Well, Zacchaeus, of course, has a problem. He's small in stature. 
And considering that people weren't as tall then as they are now, he's probably less than five feet tall. Imagine Danny DeVito climbing up in that tree, and uh, that might give you a picture of what's happening. All right? Now, we went to Jericho a few years ago with a group from the church, and the guide pointed out a local sycamore tree. The tree was probably, I don't know, 30 feet high with wide branches. A pretty tree, a tree that would have been easy to climb. But in Jesus' day, just like today, it would have been very undignified for a man to climb a tree, especially the chief tax collector. So we know Zacchaeus is short, but why was he so determined to see Jesus that he's willing to go climb a tree? I mean, I've been in positions where I didn't get a good view either, and it never occurred to me to go shimmy up the nearest pine or live oak, right? How many people in this world would you be willing to climb a tree to get a glimpse of? Well, I want to throw something out there. At this point in his life, Jesus has developed quite a reputation. But not everybody liked him. For instance, we've been talking about the Pharisees a lot this fall. We know that other than Nicodemus, the Pharisees really didn't care for Jesus. And we know the Roman government didn't care for him much either. So if the government officials don't like him, and the religious officials don't like him, who does? Let's hear what people were saying about Jesus. Over in Luke chapter 7, you get this verse. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Nobody who was anybody was a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but Jesus was. And Zacchaeus, he fits both criteria. He's a tax collector and a sinner. So perhaps this man, who probably had no friends, wanted to see Jesus on the off chance that he just might find a friend in Jesus. In fact, that's one of the most amazing things about Jesus. People who weren't like Jesus at all really liked Jesus. The reason is people who felt so unloved by the rest of society felt very loved by Jesus. I want to say something to us as a church and also as a reminder to myself as your pastor that the more those who are not followers of Christ are loved by those who are followers of Christ, the more open those people may be to actually following Christ themselves. You know, it really isn't our job to change people who need to be changed. It's our job to model for them the love of Jesus Christ and put them in a position where they'll be open to Jesus and let him change them, just like he did in today's story. And that's what we're hoping to do in our Love Your Neighbor Kindness campaign. Again, over the next 30 days, we want to intentionally be kind to others without expecting anything in return. That's what grace is all about. Now, this is different from how relationships work from a worldly point of view. The world says that relationships are transactional. If you do something for me, then I'll do something for you. Or if you do something for me, then I'll owe you something in the future, right? Now, if I do too much for you and you don't do enough in return, then the relationship gets out of whack and I start to resent you, right? But in a grace-filled relationship, there's no keeping score. We act out of kindness just because someone may need it. We expect nothing in return. That's grace. That's what Jesus did. He didn't ask for payback. He just gave. That's what we're asking people to do in our church and community over the next 30 days. Do things for others without expecting anything in return. Here's how Jesus did it in the Zacchaeus story. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Now don't miss what happened here, okay? The reason Zacchaeus is even mentioned in the Bible is not because he was looking for Jesus, but rather because Jesus was looking for him. 
If Jesus had passed by that tree and never looked up, we never would have heard Zacchaeus' name. Jesus found the guy trying to find him. He gave him his undivided attention. And by going to his house, he formed a relationship with someone that everybody else had rejected. Remember, Zacchaeus was a man who had always had Thanksgiving dinner alone. When he cooked out, he only needed one steak because nobody was coming over to share with him. Okay, This is the only time we are ever told in the Gospels that Jesus invited himself over to somebody else's house. And of all people, it's the most hated man in town. Jesus could have stayed with anybody. Anybody would have gladly accepted Jesus, but it's not the mayor of the city who gets the invitation. It's not the president of the local bank. It's not the rabbi of the largest synagogue or the greatest athlete in town. It's the total reject. Now, as astounding and incredible as that was, and how the crowd just couldn't believe it, what happened next was probably even more astounding. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Now, we're not told what happened at, Jesus, at, excuse me, at Zacchaeus' house, we don't know what Jesus had for dinner. We don't know how the conversation went. We don't know how long he stayed. But whatever else happened that day, we know that Zacchaeus was convicted, converted, and convinced because Jesus had been attentive to his greatest need. His greatest need was not to be accepted by the town or even accepted by others. His, in fact, the greatest need of the re reject is not to be accepted by anybody. His greatest need was to accept the fact that he was already accepted by God. And that's exactly what he learned that day. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house since he too is a son of Abraham. Salvation had not come to Zacchaeus because he was going to give all his money away. Salvation was not the result of his giving. Salvation was the cause of his giving. God doesn't save you when you decide to change. You decide to change when you realize God saves you. Can you imagine living back then? And one day you get a knock on the door. And you open up the door. And with anger just flashing in your eyes, you see a wee little man. And you're like, you little thief, what do you want now? And he says to you, he says, you know how much money I've taken from you over the years? And he says, yeah. You say, yeah, about 100 shekels. And he looks over and he goes, yeah, you know what? That's right. About 100 shekels. Um, here's your 100 shekels back. Plus, here's 400 more. Would that make us even? And you'd be like, uh, well, yeah. Yeah, but uh, why? What's, what's gotten into you? What's happened? What's changed? And the wee little man smiles and with tears in his eyes says, well, I met this man named Jesus. And I learned that God receives the rejected. And he rejoices whenever any of us repents of our sin. Now, I don't want you to miss where this story intersects with your life and mine. You see, sometimes we need to reach out to the rejected. But to those of us who've been rejected because of something we've done, we need to repent of our actions and make things right with the people who have rejected us for what we've done to them. You see, when God comes into your life, he not only makes you right with him, but he wants you to be made right with others. Things are never right until they're completely right. And Zacchaeus was not going to be completely right until he made things right with the people that he had wronged. When Jesus comes into your life, not only should you know it, but so should the people around you know it. Too many people are like the person I heard about who, before he gave his life to Christ, he was always talking bad about others, making racial jokes, was judgmental, selfish, cheap, complaining all the time. And then he became a Christian. 
but nothing changed. He just kept on complaining, kept talking bad about people, kept living for himself. And finally, a friend looked at him and said, you know what, I don't mind that you were born again. I just mind that you were born again as yourself. <laughs> you know, giving your life to Christ doesn't make us perfect. I mean, for crying out loud, <laughs> Jesus died for our sins. But it should at least move the needle towards some type of repentance. We should be moving in the direction of Christ one small step at a time. And so if you're here today, you may need to answer some questions about yourself. Who is it that you owe? Who have you hurt? Who have you wronged? Who's rejected you because of something you've done to them? Are you willing to repay what you owe? Repair what you've broken? Give back what you've taken? If you're still rejected today by those whom you've hurt, mistreated, or wronged, the first thing you need to do is simply let Jesus find you. That's why Jesus says at the end of the story, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And likewise, are we willing to be like Jesus to those that we know have been rejected by others? Are we willing to look around and find the one who is struggling or cast away and give them some attention, perhaps even a relationship. <clears throat> Jesus didn't say that he came to be found by those who were seeking him. He came to seek those who are lost. What motivated Jesus to go to Jericho that day? I suspect it's the same thing that motivated Jesus to leave heaven in the first place and take on the form of a human being and ultimately die on the cross for our sins. You see, Jesus came to seek and save those who have been rejected and to let them know that they too, we too, have been loved. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, some Often we feel lost, we feel just out of sorts, out on the fringe, rejected. Lord, I thank you that you have sent your son Jesus to show us that we were never rejected, that you love us, that you've always wanted to be in relationship with us and that you accept us no matter what we've done in our lives or what we're going through. Lord, I pray that not only would we accept that message for ourselves, but we would spread that message to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is found on page 571. I invite you to stand as we sing, Go Make of All Disciples.
I'd now like to invite Julia Walker Jewell to come forward and uh, join me here for our close. And Julia, I will give you the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, next year marks my 30th, 30th year here as, as director of music. Ooh. I appreciate all the love and support you all have given me and have given my family for all this time. Um, that being said, it's time for me to pass, pass the torch on to the younger generation. And so um, I'm going to retire at the end of this year. Um, so I am sure that God is working, preparing someone else to take my place. And um, nothing has happened. I, it would be much easier to storm off mad. <laughs> but that's not the case. I adore this staff. I adore this congregation. Uh, it's just time for me to go on to that second phase, that next phase. It's probably beyond the second at this point. <laughs> and um, my family won't go anywhere. This is our church home. And so we'll be here. They'll be here. Um, and I can't remember what else I was supposed to say. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Again, thank you so much for, for your love and support. As you heard, Julia's not going anywhere. Um, She's going to continue to work with us uh, through, uh, through the end of this year. Her family's going to stay here in the church. Um, we do have a search committee that we have uh, created, and uh, boy, they've got their work cut out for them because, uh, my goodness, you know, in her 29 years here with us, not only is she the best musician in town, but she's an incredible leader um, within, not just to the choirs, but to our whole church. And, uh, Holy moly, um, we've got some big shoes to fill. But um, as she said, I think someone's already being prepared for that position, and um, we just have to find out who it is, and they're going to be excellent in their time. But uh, we do thank Julia for all of her hard work over all these years. I'm going to invite you, we're not quite to the end of the hour, so I'm going to invite you, if you will, to sit back down, and, um, and just in, in honor and respect of, uh, of her great ministry among us, I'm going to ask you to listen to her postlude. And so let's just enjoy uh, her work as, as we go. And as you leave today, love your neighbor as yourself. All right? Amen. Let's go. Here you go, y'all.